I hope everybody could hear me. If they don't, if they can't, text or, or chat and and, uh, and 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 let us know. This, uh, surviving to thriving. I really mean it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I really want this period of time where we're socially uh, distanced and isolated to be a time when when things could be turned around. I know that sounds. I'm going to make a good case for it, and, and you'll see. Um, I. Uh, um, I, I, I include, the, you mentioned my book and you mentioned the, the right word and that is practical. And when Temple Grandin wrote the forward and the one thing she said about the book was that it's, it's practical. And, and that's, that's the only thing that she really loved about the book. And that's what I want this talk to be. This is gonna guide me. I want what I'm saying here today to be, used to be useful and used and the um and when i talk about these uh uh questions that i'm getting i mean they're very very important i'm looking at every single one of these questions that i've gotten i've gotten the about 12 questions and it's and it's guiding my talk because i want the you the listeners to get something out of this talk and a lot of these Questions have to do with um, uh, uh, language and speaking, so uh, attention. So um, I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna distract myself by saying, uh, let's talk about this idea of attention is really interesting, and that is. Uh, just yesterday, I'm on the phone with somebody, the kid's all over the place, right? And, but when a child is engaged in something, all of a sudden, the attention problems, the focusing issues, they're often gone. So here's a kid that I, I, um, I just cut this clip the other day, uh, a Zoom session, and no, notice the father's face and, and see what he's excited about. He's trying to play. Come here. He's trying to play. He's trying to play. He just put he just put one mallet down and trying to play with one mallet. <laughs> He's trying to play play mine. Let me play yours. Yes. I want to play yours. Tell him I want to play his. Now, I can't see all your faces because I'm. Oh wait a second. I want to. I I should. This is what I want to do. I want to. I didn't press play. Okay, this is better. Um, that um, a couple of things here. I just right off the bat, the father's excited because he's relating to somebody. That's why he's 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 happy. He's re the kid is relating to somebody, and this is the, if we talk about language and relate and, and relating, they 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 go together. Here's a child that has almost no language, and during the session, he said a word that he never said before, and we can talk about that later. But my approach is, is a cognitive approach, teach the kid in the moment, and keep, once you have the child engaged, what I don't do is saying, yay, good job, you, you're relating. No, what I do is I try to go to the next level. I try to keep the child going. So I'm just using this as an example to, illustrate my approach a little bit because uh, people talk about early language. The kid's engaged, the father's very happy, and what do I do? I say, oh, he wants to share his xylophone with me. Uh, he wants, he likes me sharing the xylophone with him. The next sentence is that I want him to share it with me. I'm asking him to share it with me. He didn't respond, but I'm looking for him this give and take. And as as we go through the talk, he's trying to play. Come here. He's excited. He's to play the questions that you might have, again, write them down. You could you could text me as well. Um, uh, what your concerns are, what you're interested in, um, friends, getting my kid to talk about uh, having time for yourself. So use the chat function, um, and, and this will guide my talk. And I understand that most of you 
are probably looking more at the background of my my office here rather than <laughs> rather than really listening to what I'm saying. <laughs> Actual content is like two percent. It's a cute little uh, diagram. You're mostly checking out my uh, my house and my office and and uh, how you're looking. So that I just just something I I throw in here. Um, it's a whole new world. We know that. When I first gave this talk, I put down taking care of yourself. Fine, we all know that. You've heard this 20 times already. Like with the airlines, you have to put your mask on first. Protect yourself. You have to be safe before you can help your child. Um, protecting the elderly, we all know that. So the first time I gave this talk, I really needed to concentrate on educating your child. That's, you know, that's, that's, what we're here for. But now, after weeks or months of this social isolation, taking care of yourself becomes more important. Um, parents are having a hard time, at least the parents that I've, I've been working with here. I have some people in, in India who I see. And um, because, as we said before, I did talk at this international conference a, a year and a half ago. Um, and I still maintain a lot of people I'm helping there. And here, uh, it's very difficult for some of my parents. One parent is working in a hospital. She's the, she sees death on a regular basis. She's very stressed. There is a death in her family. And she has a, uh, a child on the spectrum. And she texted me 2.45 in the morning saying, how am I going to explain the, this death in the family to my daughter? And I answered her right back, 2.45 in the morning, saying, I'll be here, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll work. So it's, it's uh, I say we're only as happy as the least happy child. Um, I believe that. I believe that. There are plenty of people, when they say, take care of yourself, you can predict what most people say. You have to meditate, you have to have time to yourself, you have to, uh, you know, call friends, you have, you know, and, but as a parent, and I have a parent with, uh, with a kid on the spectrum, if the kid is a lot better, you're better. And I don't see your faces, but I, I'm, I'm imagining some of you are like saying, yeah, you know. Um, I mean, I had a parent who said, I didn't, want to, I, don't want to, I didn't want to wake up in the morning because and face this child who is severely autistic. I said, what can I do for you? And she said, get my kid better. That's the only thing that matters to me, help my kid. And, um, and so I, I present reality. And, and I, I, I only present it because I feel that, that we might be able to do something about it, or I might be, may be able to help. Um, Family difficulties. Now, here's a suggestion that may or may not work. Just the fact that the, your families are, are together, kids are living. I have two older boys living with me now. Um, and uh, there are just family issues coming up. It may not be a bad idea, and I didn't make this up, but uh, this clinical psychologist I worked with uh, told me this about this, and it makes sense to have a time of an evening. It could be the same time every evening or once every couple of days. Yes, at eight o'clock at night, we're gonna to get together. We're gonna to talk about what we're upset about with each other. Um, here's the issue that I told her. That's a great idea. But a lot of parents, when they get kids together and family together, this is the time that, that we have to listen to each other. Very often it's the parent telling the child, you should do this, you should do this. And we're not listening to the kid. We have to listen to our kids. Um, space, it's a big deal. We have to, it, there's just not enough space to, to have a, a, you know, your, 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 your normal life, your routines. And so that's something just to be aware of. And you have your own routines that are getting interrupted. I mean, they could be important or not so important. You know, I'm, uh, 
coming here this morning, rushing for this, for the uh, for the talk, and my 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 older boy is asking me questions about uh, something else, and and it's like, wait a second, I'm I'm in a rhythm to get here at a certain time, and he's asking me important questions. So it's it's just it the it's not it's not easy. Um, um, but what I really want to do today is turning a negative into a positive, and we'll talk about that later. Um, now, here we are. You're forced to homeschool. Most parents would not choose to homeschool. Um, and so we're almost in a position to, to be forced to do something that we're, we don't even want to do. Education versus schooling. Um, schooling is within a school. It's mostly limited between the, the walls. Education is limitless. Even if, even if you can't go anywhere, still, if a child has an idea or a, a feeling or a, a, a what they want to explore, it really is limitless. So I just wanted to plant that. And then the parent training is what we're gonna be talking a lot about. So we're gonna talk about routines and sensory awareness and love, something that usually people don't talk about, love being happy. And we want to have that kind of worked out in some way so there's some degree of comfort at home, some degree of peace. Then we're gonna talk about my favorite part, actual homeschooling training to significantly improve your child. I wanna turn this whole thing around so your child, it's, we can really make a significant difference with your child, fundamental change language and socialization. So I'm gonna stick with that. Um, and, um, and, and then finally, the sec my secret to thriving. Um, so what a lot of people have heard, I think you probably have heard, now your kid's home from school, mirror the routines of school. If the kid is, has a nap at 10.30, have your kid have a nap. Or if the kid has lunch, have the, and I'm thinking, that. Does that really make sense? Is, what are you, what's the idea? The kid's not going to know he's home? Um, so what, what I think is more useful to you is now establish your own routines for yourself. Now, we know our kids on the spectrum kind of go along and need, let's say, routines. That's fine. But, um, but fine. So establish routines for your child, but really having yourself in mind. By that, I mean that maybe after lunch, you need to have a business Zoom, Zoom session with somebody. You know, you need that time to maintain your, your business or your, your relationships or your work. And so after lunch, your kid needs to routinely do something on his own or her, her own. Uh, it, it, it could be, you don't care, really, because because it's, it's out of necessity. It could be uh, video games, it could be homework, it could be reading a book, whatever it is. Uh, you, you have to be left alone. Have that as part of your routine. Uh, maybe after dinner. Um, uh, you, the, if the kid doesn't do his or her homework, the kid's not gonna do it at all. Fine, so after homework, after dinner, the kid has to do his homework. Make it real and make it useful and, and make it effective. Uh, now, here's a question. I don't know if I have this down. Uh, uh, okay, this is, this is the problem. Let me just talk about one more thing about routines. Um, that who is the routine for? In the classroom, is the routine for the child or the routine for the teacher? I've asked this question many times. Most people or many people say, well, it's for the, the student. The student kid needs to have a routine. And when it comes to a bedtime routine, I'm 100% for that. It's, it's, it, it's, there's something good about the routines, but it's also for the teacher. You have to admit, the routines are also, if, if a kid's gonna, sees a butterfly outside the window, the school you know, window, and the kid's so excited, he's gonna say, his first word, and the teacher says, um, 
you know, no, no, we're all here in a circle. You have to come back. We can't have everybody going their own way. And we'll have free time, you know, in an hour. You know, I mean, you know, it's, I understand that. In that way, the teacher needs to do the routine for herself or himself. Um, but I'm not saying looking at it in a negative way. I'm saying routines in school really, in some, to some degree, is for the teacher. Fine, have the routines in school for you, because now you're the teacher at home. So if you could think of it in that way, it may give you a sense of flow to, to your day and, you, and satisfy your needs. The problem is that when a child is upset because they can't get their ice cream or whatever they're going to, you know, their, their fast food or whatever, you know, uh, because of some circumstance that happens in your life, you could always say, before this, you could say, oh, don't worry, we'll get it tomorrow. This, we can't do that now because of isolation. So uh, we don't have that. We can no longer say that. And um, I don't know. It's just, it's just an awareness thing here. Uh, sensory overload is real. It's real. If there are more people in the house, there are more smells, there are more noise, there's more noise, uh, the kid may feel oppressed and anxious. And the kid may need more time by himself. Ironically, here he's isolated. He may need more or she may need more time by himself. And, um, and I know what you wanted, you want to, you may say, hey, it's family time. We have to eat together. It's bonding time. And the kid just may not be able to handle it just because of sensory overload. A lot of these kids are, as you know. So it just, again, it's something you have to maybe cut these kids some slack. And they may need to be in their room or in, in isolated in a, in a corner of the room for a long period of time. Leave them alone. You might need that kind of aloneness. Uh, so what I'm saying is to be flexible, be open for the child to need to be isolated. Your child may need more, need more of something or less of something. The kid may need, they may need more hugs. The kid may need less hugs. You know the sensory overload is a tricky thing. But to be aware of that as a factor, instead of reacting to, you know, taking it personally, um, uh, it's something to be aware of. Your routine may not work. I like that. Sorry, what you're used to doing may not work. There's, there's an awareness of sensory overload that needs to be kind of figured out um, before we could go on to the next step. And I'll be repeating that in a minute. Loving your kid may not be enough. The kid has to feel the love from his point of view. We started with that for those who came in early. Uh, the, uh, the kid has to feel the love from his or her point of view. Now here's a, Let's see what this kid says. Love needs to be both ways. Where's the love? Is there a family a feeling that they, they, they want to be with you, they love you? Isn't there some kind of good feeling of There's love? There's always a fight. Where is the love? I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking for the love. Well, you're not finding it. <laughs> But isn't that the whole idea of being with your family, that you love each other? What? <laughs> what do you mean, what? <laughs> what? So, um, okay, so here's my point here. Um, thank you for, for, for tuning in with your, your lovely faces. Um, we talked about routines and sensory overload. We did that first. Your child needs to feel loved, whatever that, whatever, whatever that means from his or her point of view. And hopefully we'll have some semblance of peace. Now, next, we're gonna do the homeschooling, the parent training, significantly improving your child. And language and social socialization is fundamental change. So we're reviewing this. Now we're going to the next part actually making a difference. 
So I'm taking a, a breath here. Ah, I'm going to tell you my secret. And it is a secret, kind of. I never told anybody this until I started doing these talks. And, um, and it's my own way of working with kids. I mean, did you ever wonder, you may have a kid who's a teenager, an adult, or an eight-year-old, and the kid had problems with, let's say, language, and there's been very little progress for years. It, it's a, or a teacher may say something, you try it six months later or a year later, a teacher may, another teacher may say something else and you try it, and the progress and the success is limited. Um, I'm going to give you my take on why that is. Because the kids could be, have a wonderful teacher uh, in, in a classroom, uh, other kids, opportunities to be socialized, it's not working often because there's something that has to be done first with, with, within the child himself. There has to be something that the child himself needs to do, understand, develop, develop. For example, if a child doesn't have the ability um, to understand another person's point of view, let's just say, okay? Uh, he's not going to talk. You need four or five, six things, particular things, maybe out, so maybe six things, in order to speak in the first place. One of them is, in using this example, that you expect a response. A child's not going to speak unless they expect a response from somebody. The child doesn't have the, the idea that, hey, you, you're, you know, you exist, you have feelings, you, you are, you're a person too, meaning you as a parent then the child's not going to speak. So here's my point. We can teach them. This is what I do in my office. If that's what it is, and there could be several things like that, if that's, a, if that's what it is, the child needs to learn to understand another person's point of view. That's not being done in most classrooms in most schools. It's, in, it's I was going to say impossible, and I think it is impossible with, with eight, you know, five, six, seven, eight kids. You have the kid. It has to be done individually, because your child is different from the next child. This is that's that's what I'm, that's my secret. That it may take me six months to prepare a child's mind, like what I'm saying now, for a child to be ready to have a friend, a mutual back and forth relationship. But that six months of changing significantly, the processing and the thinking of the child is uh, is everything. It's everything because it's significant change. This is what we as parents have the opportunity to do with our children right now. So this is what I'm talking about when I say turning a negative into a positive. It's an enormous opportunity. So I'm going to do my best to share my thoughts about this. Um, I put observing your child, assessing your child, I mean, you're going to turn on. And what do you mean? I, I look at my kid every day. I want you to see the, your child in a different way. Um, maybe. Or maybe you already have, have you know, done this. Uh, see what your child does just being totally left alone. Does your child line stuff up? Does he grab on you? Does he cry? Does he play with something? Does he does video games? Just see how he kind of is in his you know, given total freedom. See what, if I, here, if I asked you and I started doing this, what is the one thing about your child that you want to, what, what you want him to be better at, all right? That's what we wanted. When you say handle mood and personality variations, great. Let's talk about that. Uh, the, um, the, the language. He's uh, uh, 10 years old and, and, he, and, and the child's language is, is not as good as you want. Let's get that better. Let's, you know, and, and this, is what, this is what this talk is all about. Oh my God, you smiled. So you do appreciate me and how I'm killing myself to keep you alive and well. And the little guy says, Nope, just pooping. 
so it's not it's not always going to work you know it just this thing this stuff isn't gonna you know i'm going to show you tapes of of examples of what i do with kids but uh, to be honest i may in one session i may have tried 30 things and one thing worked i'm happy with that i mean really worked i'm happy with that so you have to know what I think of as the right thing or the perfect thing for your child and then continue doing that. I just had this conversation with somebody in India yesterday. And once you know that's, hey, that's it, that's good. Your child should be able to do that. You try it 30 times and you will get the response, I think, that, that you're looking for. Um, language and socialization, they do to go together. Here's some just little practical things. Um, at home exercises to elicit language from your child. Don't fill in for your child. This drives me nuts. I'll have a parent and I'll have a sibling. The child says something. I can't understand it. The sibling says, oh, what he's saying is that you should blow the balloon. Well, why doesn't he say it? Why do I need you to interpret what he's saying? Why does he have to use this abbreviated language? My philosophy is, if a child understands the concept and understands the idea, then the child should, say, should be able to say it. Language comes from ideas, from thoughts. Um, not everybody believes that. It's just, it's just an approach. And you could, you know, take it the way you want to take it or disagree. And, you know, the behavioral ABA method would say, no, you know, you, how do you measure thoughts? They'll just say, you know, you hold up a card and, and, and say the word house or, or whatever, and now the, word, now the child learned the word house. I think it has to come from ideas, from within. And you guys know Dr. Kyron, who, I, who speaks with your group many, many times. He has many videos, um, Ram Kyron. His favorite, uh, his favorite takeaway, from, I'll even show you, from my book, and I'm very proud of this book, his favorite takeaway from this book, Uniquely Normal, is, is that language comes from within. That's his takeaway. And I, I, I love when I hear what people get out of the book, but that's, that's it. Language has to, and I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna show you an example. Uh, no more dragging your hand to the refrigerator. It, try to enlist that language from your child. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that it could be done. Magical speech. This is something else that, that the kids learn. The kids learn magical speech. And what do I mean by that? J yesterday, I mean, <laughs> this, this kid says, uh, open door when he wants his father to stand up so he could grab something that, he sit that the father is sitting on. Because open door means he wants you to do something. You see, the first time he said open door was great. We know that. But then he uses this language. It could be open. It could be go. Go means like anything. Go means blow the balloon up. Well, why don't you just tell me to blow the balloon? Why do we mean go? They use this abbreviated language. It's like, I, I, I think of it as magic. Probably other people have called it magical too, but... Uh, I call it magical speech, magical language, that means everything. Why? Because it works. That's why it works. We respond to it. Um, it's, it's, we train our kids to have magical language. Now it's my job to break it. Now it's your job to break it in, in a way that, that we can talk about. And, and, and talk more about in the question and answer period or, or whatever. But we have to at least be aware that it, this is not good for the kid to say move when it just means keep, uh, keep driving. The kid says move. That means keep, whatever it is, wherever it is, it means let's keep going. It's, we have to have the kids using language because as you know, the kid's gonna be in, in school or other people and it's just not going to be, be it's not going to work because people aren't going to know his his particular language uh they are as sweet as they look and now i'm going to give you an example that i've been talking about at least one example of eliciting language from within so i'm kind of provoking her in a sense 
uh, she did something here, I'll be honest with you, that was really, really, yeah, I'm a person too. This was really annoying. I turned around for a minute and she takes this glue and she's squeezing all my glue into this cup or these, whatever, these cups. And, um, and, and it's not the behavior that we want to change. It's really what's underneath the behavior. That's part of my cognitive approach, and maybe I should have introduced it as such. Um, I want to know what's going on in her mind rather than him. I don't care about her behavior, whether she's doing the glue or not doing the glue. I don't want to change that. I want to get to her mind. So I did something, as you'll see, to just see what happens if that stimulates her to do something with her mind. This, by the way, these are one of her very first words that she ever said. Now what's interesting about that is that if you ask a speech therapist, what are the words that a child should learn there's a list of all the common words. I'm sure garbage and trash isn't part of the first 50 words that the child's supposed to learn. So this, it's, it's the, who, who taught her garbage? <laughs> I mean, it's coming from within herself. It's there, the language is there. And this, this thing, and I believe this, tapping the reservoir of normalcy to treat autism. I really believe that. There's a normalcy inside our kids. And you know that. As parents, you definitely know that. You know that, and I've heard this uh, literally a thousand, maybe thousands of times, that my kid knows much more than what he or she is, is appearing to, to be. Um, and and it, there is a reservoir of normalcy. And, and my job, and now it's going to be your job to start, uh, to, to tap this, and to surface this reservoir of normalcy. Um, if there are questions about echolalia, I would, this is a wonderful teaching take. An echolalia means echo. The kid says something over and over again, right? What do you want to do? And the kid says, what do you want to do, <laughs> right? Do, do you want to have, you want to play with the paper or you want to play with the ball? Play with the ball because it was the last thing, right? You know what I'm talking about. Um, that one question had to do with this that I've gotten so far. So at the end of this talk, the q and I'll be happy to have done it before. Be happy to go back to echolalia and Ambika. If there's a question with echolalia, you can put it to the front and, we'll, and I'll go through this take. But, you know, there are plenty and plenty of other things to, I, I, to talk about. This child had no language in the beginning. What do I do? Say push it. Tell me, push it. I do it. Push it. Push it. Say push it. Say push it. Okay, the kid, I'm trying. I found something that the kid's interested in, right? There has to be emotion. That's another, that's another one of these six things. Uh, there has to be emotion behind language or else no language, no meaningful language. Um, so she wanted to do the, whatever the clicker thing was, and she wasn't relating to language at all. Uh, after five weeks, Julia, who should open the bottle? You open it, Ron. Who should open the bottle? Julia, who should open the bottle? Who should open the bottle? You open it, Rob. Who should open the bottle? You by Rob. Okay, I'm gonna open it. Um, Who should open the bottle? Who do you want to open the bottle? Hmm? Who should open it? Do you want to open it, or should I open it? I'll open it, Rob. Okay, yeah, okay, go ahead. You open the bottle. I want so it, it gives you a sense of I mean you know this is one kid this is a snapshot but this is 
but this couldn't be done in it just couldn't be done in a classroom in fact the the uh her school her nursery school um she just was was literally lost at her nursery school she literally i went to her nursery school she just seemed very just lost so it's it's hard to do what you can do with your child one on one so that's that's what we're looking for uh exercises for socialization have your child recognize others we even i use that as an example siblings and parents also have rights now this is this is a, one of my approaches one of my tricks if you will you have a okay i'm with a kid the kid says i want you to order chocolate coffee ice cream all right we're walking around his his neighborhood i don't like coffee ice cream there's no way in the world i'm going to order coffee i don't care who it is so the i have to get coffee ice cream of course because he wants coffee he's getting coffee ice cream it doesn't matter he's getting it he wants me to get it also and um i'm not getting it but this is the lesson it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the an argument this is a 5 year old kid 6 year old kid it took me about 20 minutes for him to understand it from my point of view that i don't like it and i'm not getting it and that was one of the most valuable lessons that he he got it he got the idea that somebody else has feelings outside of himself how important is that we could do that I know good teachers do that. They try to do that. It can happen in a classroom, but you have this opportunity. If that's the thing that your child needs, I don't know. You know, I'm trying to find that out with with your questions. But if that's the thing that your child needs to make a real significant difference in terms of relating and language, then you can do that. You can do that because you have rights, and that's one way that I I do it because. there's you don't there's no you have a right to feel the way you feel and that's an opportunity for the child to see that a be a messenger between mom and dad uh just have fun i mean <laughs> the reason i'm doing this for more than 30 years with thousands and thousands of clients is cuz it is fun there's a there's an element of fun here you know give this to daddy he gives it to daddy and daddy says No um no I I I wanted uh, I wanted two pencils I just didn't want one pencil or whatever and you have the kid go back and forth using language as 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 much as he or she can and answer questions um and then of course with the socialization zoom has been working I just figured out a way where two kids could watch the same movie together using uh what is zoom because zoom you have to pay for to watch it for more than an hour, 40 minutes there's another thing i think it's google play and i could get that for you um that you can uh yeah yeah i think you need netflix and google something google play or something you could figure it out better than i can but there's a way of doing it which is cool two people could watch the movie the same movie together or anything they want on youtube um So ah how do you teach social now you know what this is now now if if you could unmute yourselves i know you know what what this is and and i uh i'll probably pronounce it it's puri right and um uh yes it is and um so but had but this is my point i'm in i'm in india in somebody's house and wonderful beautiful house and and they had their own cook and i'm eating this and i mean you could you, it's 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 incredible it's totally delicious so i'm eating it and it's it's air and it's 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 so easy to eat and before i finished it there's another one and before i finished the next one there's another one I must have eaten six or seven and I realized I I was kind of embarrassed you know and the father of the kid said hey he made me feel better he said don't worry the last person was here ate 10 of them <laughs> so but here's my point when I was telling this kid about it uh 
he said, oh, you must have told them you wanted more because he's very concrete. He has Asperger's. Uh, he can't imagine them knowing that I wanted more without me saying anything. I said, no, when I was eating curry, I didn't, I didn't say anything. How did they possibly know? Again, 15 minutes later, he realized and that's the thing. It has to be from his point of view. I just can't tell him. That's why I say 15, 20 minutes, which is real. You want him to get to the realization. You don't want to just tell him. Um, but then he realized, oh, it must have been because of the way you, you they saw how much you loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Reading body language is, is one of the things these kids have to learn. So probably for the first time, this kid, at least in his head, realized he saw the way you're, you, you, you're, you were in terms of your, the way you loved it, the way your body and language was. I don't think he used the word body language, but he got it. Good. All right. That was a su su successful lesson on socialization, and I thank uh, Puri for that, balloon bread. Um, we no longer have this. We can't do this. This is a... Uh, do you recognize this? This is the subway station at, at Coin Batua. I was waiting for my kid and I just snapped this picture. Uh, there's my kid with the Brahmin bull um, in India who spent uh, eight months there, seven, eight months there. This is the conference that I was talking about with, um, uh, uh, with, with the, uh, some of the speakers. Um, uh, and uh, more wonderful, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful friends, but we can no longer do that, right? So what's going to make your child thrive? All right, this is the kind of the last part of the talk, um, the homeschooling, the idea, again, of looking at your child, figuring out what could make a real difference and using taking the opportunity of being alone with your child one-on-one -on -one to really get some significant change. That's, that's the heart of, of my talk. Now, this idea of going with her flow or his flow is, is critical in terms of thriving, if, it is, if it's appropriate for your kid. Uh, so you have, a, you have beautiful mountains there. There are, you know, you can still take your kid out. You know, so I did this with this kid just right. a few weeks ago, um, getting crayfish from the uh, local store. This girl knows every, she knows the life cycle. She tells me crayfish has a thousand offspring. I, I bet she's right. I don't know. Uh, so go with the flow of your child. And, uh, oh, I, I spend... 90% of my 80, probably 80% of my time outside my office, just kind of go with their interests. Um, online classes, I don't, you don't even, you don't need to, it's, it's free classes it's for older kids. They're amazing. I'm doing one of them online, but here's, here's what I want to end with and I want to take questions. And that is, in, and in case you haven't heard this about Isaac Newton and I think it was 1665, he's in uh, Cambridge University. And there was a plague, the Great Plague of London. And everybody had to socially isolate, this is true. So he had to go 60 miles from Cambridge to his parents' house, okay, in, in, uh, in, in uh, 60 miles away. And uh, he totally thrived because I'm not saying all our kids are like Sir Isaac Newton um, and most of our kids need guidance and help. But without the constrictions, at least at that point, of, of the schooling, of needing to do what he's told to do, right? Which is what, I'm not saying that's a negative thing, but he, he was released from that needing to do what his teachers told him to do. He had the freedom to just explore totally on his own what he wanted to, what his thinking was. He, he did uh, math that became the beginning of calculus. And 
And Rubis had it. He had an apple tree where his parents were, and he discovered the, um, the theory of gravity. And he, it, it was an opportunity for him to think in a, like I started to say, education is limitless. So that is something that we can see. And here's something, I'll end with this. Uh, I thought this it was brilliant. Uh, this woman, uh, Marsha Eckert, mentioned this to me the other day. Um, you know how you th think when you're, when you're younger, five years ago, when you're a kid, you say, oh, I always wanted to study astrology. I always liked this. Astrology for me, I always found that interesting, but I know it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I just have too many, too other things to do, too many other things. Um, that might, this may be a time to explore those things. What, what has been part of me for a long time that I, but now I may have the opportunity to actually really be involved with it and go and get into it. And um, it could be for yourself and it could be for your child. Oh, he's always interested in that, but we never, let's explore that. We have the whole internet, we have the whole world in front of us. So, um, right. Oh, and Beacon, um, I'm, in this, yeah, the book here, it, it won like six awards. I'm very proud of it, that's great. This is my favorite picture of Temple Grandin. And, and now there's an audio book, but, um, but please, uh, questions, this is, this is your child. And we have the opportunity, a real opportunity to do something. So you are totally welcome to, to take my number and text me, 91, it's, I guess it's 1914, right? 330-3393, uh, RJ, RJB is my initials at autismspeech.com. Feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer questions, help you, guide you, give you a hint, give you a suggestion of, uh, of what, uh, you know, what direction, if you need, if you think it, it could help. Uh, I have a free parent group. Now this is this is U.S. <laughs> New York Times, so forget it. <laughs> you know, this is like the middle of the night for you guys, right? Um, but I may be, you know, if there are enough people in India who want a free parent group, I'm offering, and I'm not the only one, free services during this time. Uh, and I have a podcast at at Autism Speech. Um, you, you could you could I'll, you email me and I'll tell you about the podcast. But um, so let's let's open it up to uh, to questions and um, and, uh, and uh, thanks, Rob. Um, I shared all the questions that were shared on the chat on your WhatsApp. Um, okay. These are all the questions that we've received so far. So. So uh, all right. So did something? I'll look at those now. And did something? Oh, here. Oh, good. Uh, so let me see. Let me go to the to the beginning here. Uh, behaviors cropping up due to negative situation. Okay. Uh, so um, um, well, some of these I sort of answered uh, I, a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, so here's something we didn't talk about. My 12-year-old nonverbal son on attention deaf, uh, autistic kid started behavior plucking leaves from the plant. He just takes it and it's self-stimulating. So um, <laughs> maybe I should go back to, uh, uh, so this, this idea of self-stimulating behavior, the stimming, is uh, is an interesting question. Um, let me see if I could if I could see you guys. Uh, let me see if I could. Let me see if I could uh, if I could still share. And no, this isn't going to work. Or well, maybe it will work. Um, I'm trying to get a, a way of seeing you guys. Uh, so, um, th does everybody know what 
this, this stimming is, what we're talking about. It's repetitive and repetitive behavior. It's part of the definition of autism that there's going to be some kind of repetitive behavior. It could be a repetitive thought. And um, I talk about that. Uh, I have a, 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 an example in the book. A kid keeps on going like this. And, and he comes into my office and there, his hand is, is bleeding. Um, a couple of, you may not like this answer. Um, what's underlying some of this repetitive behavior is that the child is not um, communicating. He's frustrated. He's not, um, uh, he's not, um, uh, uh, he's frustrated because he's, he doesn't have the language. So again, it, you're not going to like, maybe you're not going to like this, this, uh, this, this answer because it's not, it's not changing his behavior immediately. And there are plenty of, I can give you answers towards that as well. But if we could have him maybe express more and communicate more, then this perseverative behavior like plucking the plant or, or scratching himself and doing all kinds of things, he'll, his mind will be occupied with so many interesting thoughts and expressions, he won't be doing that stimulator, that self-stim behavior. Um, the, uh, the other thing that comes to mind, and this is with the plant, is see if you could use that for, for language. It may work, it may not work. You know, the kid lines up cars. Well, what happens if I turn the car the other way? Well, he turns it back. Is that something that, um, that we could uh, use to have his mind be more aware and more active? I hid a, I got the kid to say his very first word. He's 11 years old. Never, never said any word at all. Um, and, and he was doing this stuff with these blocks. And I put one of these blocks in order, right? Uh, and I took one away. And he was looking for that. And he was looking for that block that he was kind of obsessed with. And here, tell me if this makes sense. What word uh, would he say while he's looking for the blocks? It's not going to be block. He's not thinking block, I don't think. At least at that moment, I didn't think so. He was thinking, I think, where? Where is it? Where is it? So I thought that was it. And I must have repeated it, you know, where? Say where? Where? I, it must have, I wanted that to get into his head. I must have said it 30 times. And finally, he said, what? Finally, he's connecting language, literally connecting language to his visceral feelings. Um, so let's use this self-stim, the stimulation, maybe, maybe as a means of, of eliciting language, but also let's see if the communication could be enhanced. So that's, um, uh, so should I read these questions in Beaker or would you want to, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, it's up to you, Rob. Uh, would you want me to go through? Because, I mean, whatever you find. Well, I'll ask this. Now that you've heard me talk, I mean, uh, I, I, I have, there's another question here that I'd like to you know, answer. Now that you heard me, is there anyone who has like a burning question that, that's, um, uh, that touches on something that I didn't talk about or did talk about? that you could unmute yourselves. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll just, there was a question uh, about a 27-year-old 20, using devices. Um, I feel kind of strongly about this. And that is, if your kid is 27, 37, I deal, dealt with kids in their 60s, people in their 60s. Um, I feel, I really feel that that we shouldn't give up on the fundamental language and relationships. When your child was three or four years old, what, how, do you, how did you feel? I can't, I, I'll do anything to get my kid not to be autistic, right? It's like, this can't be happening. Now, the kid's 14 years old, at least in the United States, I think it may be the same in India, 14, 15. What does the system do? 
the system says, now it's vocational training. We're going to get you a job that you're going to do the rest of your life or something like that. Now we got have to teach you how to function in this world. Well, what happened about learning to speak and relate and to express themselves? No, no, no. It's vocational training. Systematically, the system gives up on the child. And that's what we've been trained to do. Now the kid's 27. Uh, I'm... Uh, let me get some device. Let me, I, I've given up on that. And I'm saying no. I'm saying absolutely not. Um, if I, uh, I, I work with 20 year olds, and yes, it's the same process from my point of view of getting this kid to connect to language, to speak. I've had 30, this kid was 30, this kid, 34 years old. And he said, Where were you when I was five years old? you know, to, to be able to get him to, you know, be whole and, and to be expressive. Um, and so I've, I've been convinced in the decades that I've been doing this, that you, have, you could have a child 27 or 37 who could still create, you could still have that fundamental change. So anyway, I interrupted somebody who might have had a, uh, a burning question. <clears throat> Uh, that who who could unmute you, yourself? Was there anybody? Uh, <clears throat> anyway, otherwise I could I could answer or, or attend to some of the questions that were <clears throat> that were given to me here. Uh, <clears throat> so okay, nobody. I'm a parent of a ten year old boy. He speaks at home to the family. All right. He can engage in a conversation for a longer period if the topic topic doesn't interest him not more than a few seconds but otherwise he involves in a conversation with us but in school with outside he, he outside he doesn't talk and no response at all <clears throat> we're not able to figure out what's in his mind okay this is this is my kind of question uh you know i i, I haven't done it in a while and i'm willing to do it with you guys and Bika, here this is a suggestion I had like a Dear Rob column in one of the autism magazines. It could be just for you. Send me a question like this and I'll give you a video answer. Okay. Just, okay. I mean, it's an easy thing to do. I'm right. happy to do it. And maybe I could even start doing it with this one. This one reminds me of it. I'll give you an answer and maybe two or three, four minutes long if you guys want to do it. And it keeps us connected. So, if you have that capacity to reach out to people, this is like for a magazine, so they kind of subscribe. But I'm, I'm happy to do this, to have this uh, spread through your, you know, to your people. <clears throat> um, so he doesn't talk in school at all, or outsiders. We're not, even, not able to figure what, what is in his mind. He gets upset when we talk about school and he insists on throwing tantrums. How do you deal with a child that doesn't open up? <clears throat> this is great. And, I, and this, this involves so many different things and, and philosophies. Number one, how do you deal with a child who doesn't open up? I get it. I understand it. Um, my immediate reaction is that it's you're coming from your point of view. Who else, who else is pointing? It's silly. It's not a fair thing for me to say, but I'm using this to express, you know, my point of view that we often say this, what is, what is wrong with that child? Why can't that kid do this? I need the kid to do this. I'm a teacher. I have a curriculum, right? What is, what does the curriculum mean? I know what you have to learn. That's what a curriculum means. But whether you agree with it or not, that's what it means, right? It doesn't always work with these kids. Sometimes the learning or what they want to learn, may, maybe should come from them. Maybe it should come from them. You know, there are colleges, at least in the US, where there's absolutely no required courses. Brown University, one of the best universities in the country. There are no required courses. I mean, it's, this isn't a new concept. Um, and um, so uh, I'm not saying the person who answered it, I'm not, I'm not trying to offend you on, on, you know, turning something, I know what you mean, but I'm just using it as a way of a, 
device of, of expression, expressing something from my heart that I've seen over and over and over. It's an attitude. It's almost an attitude of, uh, not arrogance, but, um, but I'm, I don't know what the right word is, but it's like, uh, for, like that girl, right? With, with the, um, with the, the uh, uh, with the garbage trash. You know, I could have said to her, uh, I could have told, oh, say crush. She's, th I, you know, I could have told her a word that she should say. Why should it be for me? That's, that's audacious. It should be coming from her. So yes, there's a problem with, the, with, with this kid. Um, the fact that he could speak to people who are familiar, that he's familiar with is huge. I've had many kids who had to drop out of school because they felt the anxiety and the pressure. Um, even though the teachers might be great, the kids feel it. Like I said, if the kid feels anxiety and pressure, I don't care what you say or how you conduct your class. That's how the child feels. So let's see if there is something we can do. Maybe there isn't. But, um, but it, 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 there's... We have to, in this case, expand the kid's comfort zone, I think of it. He's comfortable. If he's comfortable with the teacher, if he's comfortable with strangers, um, he'll be able to talk. And I always feel I have 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes of seeing the kid to gain this kind of confidence, this kind of relationship, this kind of rapport. I've always felt that way. If I can't relate to a kid in the first 10 minutes, he could just tune me out, goodbye. I just talked to a kid last week. He said he went to seven therapists and he felt they were all frauds. And after 10 minutes, if I, did, I think the father said 14 minutes with the last therapy, he said, this is a waste of time. The guy's a fraud. Well, the first session we spoke to more, we spoke more than two hours and I talked to the parents afterwards. I said, I guess I passed the fraud test. I passed the fraud test. So. Um, um, I think it's our responsibility to create a relationship with your, a comfort with that child. I don't, yes, you're right. Your child needs to, uh, um, what's the word, um, adapt to a, a situation and be able to talk and freely engage with people. I get it. The kid needs to have a job someday. I understand it. But right now, when you want the kid to develop, to grow, to, to feel more comfortable, it's also up to us to find a situation, a way that the child could be challenged to meet new people and, and to be um, comfortable and to talk. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't know him. I don't know. I really don't know about what's in his mind, but you're asking the right question. Let's figure out what's in his mind. That's the perfect question. And that's why what the first thing I said about this person who asked this question, and you know who you are, it wasn't fair. We say, how to deal with this child who doesn't open up. I, I, I was using that as a way of saying something that I've, I want to emphasize something about, about the school. But because you said <clears throat> you, you you're, you're not able to figure out his mind. That's the most open and honest statement I've heard. And I will guarantee you, if, if I, I have some information, we will figure out the way his mind works. Because that's, that's what I do, and that's what I need to do alone with the, cat, the kid. And this is your opportunity, all of your opportunities, to... to um, to figure out your kids, look, isn't this, isn't this really refreshing? 10 years old and the parent says, I, I don't uh, know how you, my kid's mind works. That's refreshing, that's honest. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This is an opportunity for you to figure it out. And, here, and I'm sure I'm right about this. The teachers have not figured that out or else you would know about it, right? The teachers, haven't figured out how your kid's mind work, or else you would know about it. So it's up to you. It's up to you, or find somebody who could help you do that, right? It's up to you to do that. 
now is the time you have that opportunity. And because I've done this thousands of times, I've seen thousands of people. So I've, I've done this over and over again. I might be able to make that easier for you with, a, with an email. I may be able to guide you a little bit. Um, so uh, so that's, that's my response to that. Uh, by the way, when, when a kid says he throws tantrums, I wrote an article on tantrums I might be able to share with you. Um, I say, you know, you want to stop the tantrums, fine. In the punishment or reward system, fine. But it's usually coming from something else. Like that kid that I get an example with this kid pushing a, uh, an assistant. You know, he had a tantrum. Well, if you just sort of from the kid's point of view in the beginning, you know, I, I, go to, I go to schools and I say, you know, you know this one's on you. You know, you, you, you're great 99% of the time. You just missed this one thing, you know. And, and uh, you know, it's these tantrums and these behaviors that unpleasant behaviors really could be avoided if we're looking at the underlying issues. So that's, <clears throat> I mean, I could go longer. I was going to say it's a long answer to a, to a, long, a long question. See, it's a pretty long question. But uh, that's, um, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's my response to that. Any, any, I know we just have a few minutes. Who else wants to just jump in here for the last five minutes? Unmute yourself and go for it. <clears throat> Oh, I, I could see that. Ah, Sri Diya, go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Rock. This is uh, Sri Vidya. Um, I have a son who is 16 years old, and uh, he uh, he has uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, well, the language he's way below his age level in language and communication and also socialization. These are the three issues I'm facing right now. Uh, communication in the sense he's very good with receptive language but expressive is very limited uh, when it comes to socialization uh, he prefers mostly to be alone and uh, there's something I've noted a lot during the growing up years self-talking his way of communication he he just takes in information and talks to himself it's not comfortable talking to people around him so there's been a lot of self-talking and I can make it out. He's been talking from his school experience to whatever he's experienced. I can make it out. He's very familiar with people. He recognizes people's, even from the age of uh, his kindergarten, he remembers all his friends' name now. He talks about them also right now. Not to me, but, but within himself. So there's a lot of self-talking. I just want to know how to direct this into a proper conversation because he doesn't do a conversation. He's, uh, he's very good with the uh, single uh, question and answers. Okay, the so, self-talking, I, I, oh, can I, I interrupted? The self-talking, go ahead, I, go ahead, go ahead. No, self-talking was my uh, first priority because I'm just trying to work on that right. actually. I find that fascinating. And the self-talking, you're saying that it's in full sentences, that it's um, yeah. going to make yeah. sense, right? It so, makes sense, but, but the time frame, what he's talking right now, is not, as, is not at the current moment. It's like okay. two years so, ahead behind. I, well, I'm sorry, what was the last thing about behind? Two years behind? He, he talks about things which has happened in the past. So uh, how about this idea? Um, does he, does he uh, when he's beginning to self-talk, and it sounds like he's going on for some time. It's not just three seconds. It sounds like he goes on for like a, at least a minute or two, the self-talking. More than that, more than that. It goes so how, on and on. How about going to a comfortable place, like lying in bed with him or something, and just, and just a very comfortable place, and just, and uh, or, or engage in, in the self-talking and just sort of listen to him. He doesn't mind you mm -hmm. listening, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, 
and then let himself talk and use your your judgment into oh yeah you know that was interesting what happened in school yesterday try to respond to the self-talking because we all do that i mean we call it something differently we call it thinking right we reflect and he's talking out loud and that's kind of endearing um i would love you not all not all my thoughts but it, it would be really cool if somebody was listening to my thoughts and say you know you're right that's yeah, but how about this? So what, that's the first thing. Why don't you try to get into a very comfortable place? You know, don't do it in the, in the middle of chaos. A place where you're just alone with him. Uh, I mean, you, you, you know that better than me. Maybe taking a walk while he's, you know, self-talking. Or capture that moment of self-talking and, um, uh, and, and, and try to see if you could respond in a very positive way and see if that dialogue could happen. Okay, I'll do that. The, the other thing about expressing himself, he, when a kid understands a lot, and I bet it's true for most of our parents, uh, expressing, um, the kid needs to work on that. And, and that's loaded question. We need to find and this is just something I'm giving you work to do. We don't know if it's a, it, if he has these ideas, which he does because he understands what he's saying. But maybe these ideas are not organized in his mind, and yeah. it's very hard to him to express it. So if that's kind of what I'm feeling about your kid off the top of my head, then maybe maybe he needs help with that. You know, organizing his thoughts. And the way I find works is that the kids give the kids sometimes time to, or I, this happens every day with me, where a kid will say something and then change his mind. And mm -hmm. like that kid that said, stand up, what's the thing? kid that said, open door, when he wanted the child, the father to stand up. This was literally yesterday, last night at 1030, my time because it's, it's India time in the morning. He, sa he says, what? I said, what did you do when he said open door? He said, nothing. Perfect. Give the kid a chance to organize his mind. Then this kid says, sit. And he says, sit? He is already sitting. Then the kid thought about it, and the kid said, stand up. You see what, that's, you see what happened? The open door was the first one. I didn't tell you the full story. You're giving the kid a chance to reflect, think of himself, self-aware, organizing his own thoughts, and he's going through this process. Why? He wants to communicate something with his father. So let's, let's um, I, I know it's about an hour, but I'm, I'm happy to go a little longer because we started late. So um, is that, does that kind of answer your question? And of course, you could email me and yeah. let me know, let me know what works. I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, sure. I will, I will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Rob, sorry to interrupt, but with, with that thought, is it okay if I share your email address? Uh, so people yeah, please, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we can close with one question, which is, uh, you know, Brian posted this question, which is uh, uh, that, you know, he has two children on the autism spectrum and you know, when one of them gets upset, the other follows suit. So that's, I think, a very important question because handling two children with, um, uh, you know, on the spectrum and handling the challenges is a different, I mean, approaching that may be very different. So do you have any thoughts on that, Rob, when both kids are on the spectrum together? Um, and how do you handle behavior challenges in instances there? Yeah, um, I, um, I mean, I... I, if we keep on getting questions like this, I'm happy to go another 10 minutes, but it's up to you. It, it doesn't matter. To sure. Me. No, we can end with this one, if you think, or would you want to take it up later and then uh, maybe, uh, get maybe, in touch with that, Brian maybe after? Could, maybe I could hang on like I do in a face-to-face a -face talk and, and just take people's questions. But this, okay. is, um, uh, this is another one of these questions that have multi-dimensions to it. Okay. Um, two autistic kids. The chances are that one child is going to be, you know, 
the older or the younger or more advanced or more involved or less involved. And um, it's actually a good thing, from my point of view, that if somebody's upset, when the brother's upset or the sibling's upset, that the other one gets upset. And, and, and to me, it means that they're, they have a connection with that kid. I mean, it sounds trite, but there are so many kids uh, kids on the spectrum, you could be hurt and the kid won't, won't care at all about it. I'll, I'll have a, when my finger's hurt, I'll put a Band-Aid band -Aid on it and the kid will be saying, hey, what happened? what's that? What happened? Take off your Band-Aid. He doesn't care that my finger hurts. He wants to see what's underneath the Band-Aid. <laughs> he wants to see whether my nail is black because I, I got it you know, stuck in the door. He just wants to see it. He doesn't care about my feelings. So the idea that, that one of the siblings is really crying because and, and from your point of view, he's being set up, set off. And it, it's more of a disturbance for the household. From the kid's point of view, he feels the way his brother feels. So let's take that. Let's just, instead of saying, oh, it's a disturbance, what, what, how can I stop the disturbance? Go with that, with the autistic kid that's, that's crying, the second kid who's, who's crying, and say, and go to him and try to elicit language at that moment. Oh, you're so upset. Oh, your brother's crying. Oh, your brother's upset. There's feeling there. There's, there's, there's emotion there. Take that as an opportunity to get this kid to elicit language. I know it's, it's an approach that uh, I'm listening to myself and, and I'm saying, oh, I guess, you know, most people wouldn't say something like that, but I feel that very strongly. There's emotion, there, there might be understanding or not that his sibling got hurt or he's crying. I don't know, I don't know the kids. But I would use that opportunity to, for that second child to express himself or to use language. That's what I would uh, do. Can I interrupt, uh, Mr. Rob? Yes, Br uh, Brian, yes. Yeah, this is Brian, yes. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, your session has been really very, very interesting, uh, quite good inputs. Uh, so, uh, Rob, what's happening is uh, my daughter is 12, my son is 10 years old, okay? Now, uh, since both are under the spectrum, now my wife has trained my daughter in a perfect way, like, you know, as to uh, how to do things in a right way, okay? And over a period of time, she tends to become a mother of my son. So, whatever his work has to be done, she wants to do it. Eventually, he doesn't end up doing, okay, and he, he doesn't end up learning. Now, what happens is if uh, we give any instruction to my son and she overhears it, and if he doesn't do it, then there's a chaos in the house. It's like a mama has given instruction and uh, uh, Bryden is not following, so it has to be done no matter what. She'll pull him, she'll pull his hair, do whatever to see to it that he follows the instruction. So it becomes a very difficult situation sometimes, wherein like, you know, to keep both separate and then to pass on instructions, you know? So, um, and like Ambika would say, I guess this would be the last question and then I'll take, we'll end it, right? And then we'll- Sure, I, I've already shared your email address with everybody here on the chat uh, window. Um, you bring up something that is, really, really critical, really important. And, and I, um, I'm sometimes at a loss myself because a parent will bring the child to me. I, my job is to whatever, get this kid to talk, to relate, whatever, whatever it is. But I look at the situation and there's something that needs to be done from the, 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 the parent is doing something that we consider isn't right. Right? I mean, we agree with that. By the tone yeah. of you, you don't agree with the way she's insisting that this kid does what she wants to do. So now I'm in a very awkward position. The parent is paying me to work with the child. And I'm saying, wait a second, it's really something you have to do. Now, this is a group. Parents come to this group. And I call it parent training. I don't want to belittle it, but it's sort of a phrase that's been going, that I've been, you know, so, so you guys don't mind listening to me and, and maybe learning something. 
but a lot of parents aren't going to listen to me because I mean I don't know is that parent ready to change I don't know so when it's the parents uh, when something has to change with, with the parent my technique is this my technique and I'll give you one last story and then we'll, we'll end it um, um, it, it, you're going to like this. You're going to really like this story. Um, the um, the child um, was cutting herself. Why? Her parents don't love her. Why doesn't your father love you? Because he he hits her on her butt pretty hard. All right. He does this with the, with her. You know the younger brother too. The younger brother says, "I got hit." I did something wrong. I'm not going to do it again. Okay? That's how it's supposed to work. I'm not saying I'm in favor of hitting, but that's how it's supposed to work. The sister, the, my client, the kid who has Asperger's, she says, how could somebody who loves me hits me? My father doesn't love me. She sees it as a very narrow way of looking at it because she has Asperger's, right? So the father comes in and he says exactly this. And he's also, he isn't, uh, he isn't Native American. He isn't Native to America. He says, um, he says what else can I do? This is, these are his words. What else can I do? This is the way I was brought up. This is the way I, this is like, I'm similar to what, what you're talking about with, with your case. This is, this is, I can't do anything else. This is, it's not my fault. This is what we do. We hit the, that's it. there's no alternative. And I told him, I'm not here to tell you how to parent, but I'm here for the, for the, the mental health of your child. You could think the way you want. That's the way you, you've learned. That's your, your, your family tradition. That's your cultural tradition. But if you keep doing that, you're going to have a daughter who feels that she is not loved, and then she's cutting herself with, you know, with a uh, like a binder. Um, and, it, and this is also interesting, and this is important to tell you that you would think this is like what I'm talking now, like the you know 45 second conversation. It was a minute conversation. It took 45 minutes for him to take ownership of this idea. I'm changing something really fundamentally in the way his thought process is. It took him 45 minutes to realize, wow, I, I have to stop. I, I don't, and, and I'm not saying what he should do. This isn't, this is, this is my point. My perspective is what's right for the kid. I don't care what he does, but he can't hit, right? If, it, if he's coming to me for help, fine. I'll suggest other ways for him. If he's asking me, I'll tell him different ways for, for him to parent. I don't care. The only thing I care about is he, he cannot hit his kid. That's the one thing I know. I can tell him that. You see what I'm saying? It puts me in an odd position that I don't want to, I know I've, I've been around long enough to know that line. I'm not going to tell you how to parent, but I can tell you what's best for your kid. So this is, this is my, this is, would be my suggestion. The effect that she's having on her kid, she has to understand that. And then I think she'll change because she loves the kid. She wants the best for the kid. So that's, so I, I want to thank everybody for, for coming and thank, thank you for my Disha for sponsoring it. Um, and, um, and I hope, um, yeah, I hope we could do it again soon. It's up to you guys. I love great, this. Thing. Great. Thanks, Rob. It was really great. Um, so you have all the questions too. I mean, if you want to go, go over them later. Um, and I've all, I've all, I don't have the people's emails. So I, right, I but I will be able to share that once I get the feedback. So uh, okay. just give us a day or so to go over the feedback and I'll make sure I, those of uh, those parents who have um, given their consent, we will share those email addresses with you as soon as we go over the feedback. So we're going to get parents to start filling the feedback right now, Rob. Um, and okay. I will make sure I compile it and I will share email addresses and the feedback information with you uh, within okay. a day or two.
Yeah. I have another I have another appointment in about 15 minutes so I can Sure, sure. Yeah, you can uh, you can leave uh, if you need to we'll just hang around till we gather the feedback. But thank you so much for your time and effort. Rudolph. Thanks so much. I know it's a, it's a very big deal organizing this with all the Yeah, no no not at all. Um, I will be sharing the link to the recording as well with you so you will have access okay. to the recording as well, yeah? Beautiful. I love that. Great. Okay. Thanks Rob. Thanks so thank much. Thank you Rob. Thanks a lot. Bye, bye 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 um could the rest of you please stick uh, stay around please we'd like to gather feedback from you